Wonderful. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And thank you, uh, everyone, especially Shamrata, uh, for the very kind invitation. It's an honor for me uh, to be part of a series which includes really such stellar speakers, uh, Professor Basu uh, you know, included. So it, I, I realize I'm filling in some very, very big shoes. So I'm actually a bit apprehensive about in terms of the quality, in terms of the pitch that I have, whether I'll be able to match up to my uh, previous speakers in terms of academic quality. I, I'll do my best, but I'm sure it's not going to be enough. Uh, so uh, at the very outset, I'll give a very generic description of my talk in terms of what I intend to do uh, in this session. Uh, and then I'll move on to some specific texts that we can sort of map this theory on. Uh, in terms of looking at the interface of memory studies and medical humanities, which is uh, the topic that I aim to uh, examine today. <clears throat> now, uh, first things first, let's discuss uh, the ontology of these two disciplines. I mean, in terms of how uh, that this can connect the uh, interdisciplinary and uh, interdisciplinary ways, uh, memory studies and medical humanities. Now, one obvious connection that we can think of in terms of looking at literature is obviously through uh, uh, trauma fiction, the whole idea of memory, memory loss, uh, trauma, traumatic disorders, uh, and the medical extensions uh, of those conditions, uh, and how all that gets represented uh, in fiction, in literature, because at the end of the day, uh, I'm a literature person. I belong in the domain of English literature, literary studies. Uh, that is what my, whatever expertise I have, uh, is in that particular domain. So I don't claim to be uh, a neuroscientist. I don't claim to be uh, trained in clinical medicine. So all I do is I look at literary texts in terms of what they can offer uh, in terms of more nuanced understanding of memory uh, and memory loss and the, uh, the medical conditions that can extend, that can sort of emerge uh, out of those conditions. Now, uh, some of the things I need to unpack before I uh, sort of move on, uh, let's talk about memory studies a little bit, and then I'll move on to how that can connect potentially uh, to medical humanities, which is uh, obviously the, the discussion for today. Uh, now, uh, the, the funny thing about memory studies uh, is, it's not really funny in a, in a sort of dark, humorous uh, sort of a way, that we in memory studies, we're actually more interested uh, in the phenomenon of forgetting uh, rather than remembering. And so forgetting is a phenomenon that we are very interested in, uh, psychologically, culturally, historically. Uh, and we don't look at forgetting uh, as an innocent activity. We look at forgetting as a profoundly non-innocent, as a profoundly political activity. Right? So forgetting in terms of what happens uh, privately, in terms of how the brain forgets, and also forgetting as a cultural practice, uh, forgetting as a cultural ritual, forgetting as an epistemic strategy, shall we say. Uh, so how, how does forgetting happen uh, through textbooks, uh, through different discourse networks that we constantly consume uh, around us uh, as we grow up? Uh, so just uh, as a very short anecdote, uh, so in terms of how uh, certain kind of incidents, uh, certain kinds of uh, phenomena are forgotten and not sort of talked about and not part of uh, the mainstream discourse, and hence they sort of cease to exist uh, after a point of time. A very short uh, uh, anecdote that I can share at the beginning, and I usually share this uh, at the beginning of every talk on memory studies. So this was uh, when I was doing my PhD in Durham. I had a very good friend, and uh, we were watching a film together. He wanted to watch a Bollywood film. So I recommended a film called uh, Rang De Basanti, which I'm hoping uh, everyone's seen. It's a really good film, technically speaking. So we started watching that film, uh, and we enjoyed it uh, till the point that we had the very grotesque scene of the Janimwala Bhatt massacre, the Amritsa massacre, at which point uh, this very liberal friend of mine, very liberal, uh, white liberal British person, uh, otherwise very well-read, very open, very critical of imperialism, uh, you know, he sort of gets very uneasy looking at a particular scene. Uh, so we sort of pause at some point, and then he asks me point blank that, well, I'm aware that imperialism is a terrible thing. I'm aware of the you know, evil things from imperialism. But this particular incident did really take place, telling all about massacre. So it was my turn to be surprised, obviously, because here was a very well-read, well-traveled, liberal white person uh, asking me about an incident that we all know. Uh, so I obviously said, well, I'm surprised I'm uh, not aware of it. This is sort of 1918, and this is where the massacre takes place, 1919, sorry. So, uh, and this whole idea of, you know, uh, opening fire on an innocent crowd, uh, killing uh, 
innocent protesters, women, children, indiscriminately. So how is it that someone as well well as you are not aware of this? Uh, to which his response was, well, obviously, uh, we don't read it in our history books. We don't read it in our textbooks. And that was uh, sort of a moment of epiphany for me, uh, shall we say, uh, when we realized that you know, the way we consume knowledge, the way we consume history, there's such a strong textual quality about it. Uh, what we remember, and more importantly, what we dismember. And this is where it gets uh, sort of the medical meets the, uh, the memory thing. Uh, what we dismember, what we cut off uh, in terms of uh, the, the remembering narratives is very, very important and very, very politically uh, invested. So there's a lot of political investment, a lot of ideological investment, a lot of discursive investment in terms of what gets forgotten, right? And obviously, we can think of any number of literary writers where this gets manifested over and over again. So the whole, the, the primary hypothesis, the, the beginning point of memory studies is the irony that we are more interested in forgetting what does not get remembered, what you know, gets forgotten, what gets pushed into oblivion, or rather the production of oblivion, the production of amnesia. So we look at amnesia, oblivion, uh, forgetting uh, as sort of uh, productive activities, uh, as agentic activities sometimes, and obviously as discursive activities, activities which have a lot of discourse investments uh, into them, right? And obviously we know from neuroscientists today, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna mention a few neuroscientists uh, subsequently as we move on in the session, that you know the whole process of remembering is a very biased process. We know it, that a brain is a very biased machine. Uh, we know it through empirical research, we know it through medical research, there are lots of papers written on it, and I'm gonna mention a few as we move on, but the general knowledge that we have today about the brain is that it's a profoundly biased machine. Uh, it's a neural network, uh, you know, and it's very, very biased in terms of what it remembers and what it chooses to remember and what it chooses to not remember. So again, the absence becomes very, very important. Uh, and obviously, as we all know in literature, that we are more interested in literature with the sort of the articulation of absence, shall we say. Uh, what are these slippages, uh, the ellipses, the things which are between the lines. Because the whole business of literature and literary writing and literary production uh, is to sort of pack things between the lines. And that is obviously a very big deal, shall we say, uh, in literature. And that, that is what makes it ontologically different or effectively different uh, from, let's say, uh, a journalistic writing, a piece of uh, journalism, a piece of newspaper report. Uh, the fact that it can move us effectively, not just effectively, but also effectively. And we were listening to uh, Professor Basu talking about effect. Uh, it was such a brilliant session. But that's the whole business of literature in, in terms of sort of producing this effect, or this effective instrument to language. And obviously, when you're looking at effective instruments, effective representations, silences become very, very important. You know what get what does not get said what, what does not appear becomes more important uh, in, in, in literary writing and that's where memory memory loss forgetting forgetfulness uh, they sort of converge very interestingly uh, in terms of literary writing that's the reason why uh, we in literary studies are interested in these aspects as well uh, and also equally uh, that's the reason why so many neuroscientists today are looking at literature and looking at literary uh, representations in terms of having a more complex understanding of the mind uh, the mind is different from the brain. So the brain is mappable. Uh, there's a degree of uh, unmappability about the mind. There's a degree of mutability about the mind. And this unmappability and mutability is obviously the, the, the business of literature, the literary writing, the production of unmappability, shall we say. So uh, the whole idea of memory uh, being a very biased activity, a uh, memory as an entangled activity becomes important for us today. And we need to arrive again, so uh, when I mentioned at the beginning that we are more interested in the phenomenon of forgetting, what I should also say at this point is that we are looking at memory and uh, we are looking at forgetting not as an ontological opposite of remembering, but rather forgetting uh, as a cognitive component of remembering. Uh, as some kind of an entangled thing. So forgetting and remembering are not really binary opposites of each other. And again, this is something which we get from neuroscience today, that forgetting is not really the ontological opposite of remembering, but it's actually a, a cognitive component of remembering. So in other words, if you are to remember, you must be able to forget. So again, we're looking at forgetting as an ability, uh, as an agentic ability, something that we do, sometimes deliberately, sometimes non-deliberately, but something our brain must do. And again, what we are interested in memory studies is looking at the interface between the private brain uh, and the macro-cultural space. Because you know, if you take a look, if you look at the structural and functional similarities 
between how the brain remembers and forgets simultaneously, we also see a similar activity happening in the broader, more macro realm of culture, where you know, things are codified and decodified. So things are forgotten and remembered in every culture. So every nation, every national history, and we look at Britain, I have mentioned an example of British imperialism, but we can think of any national history where certain events are deliberately forgotten. In other words, certain events are deliberately not remembered, not commemorated, right? So this non-commemoration of certain events uh, as against the constant commemoration, the continuous commemoration of certain other events, obviously is a discursive difference. And so again, we're looking at the very interesting uh, interface, shall we say, between the brain and culture. And this is where memory studies becomes interesting, because memory studies on one hand, so it is obviously very psychological in quality. We're looking at neuroscience, we're looking at psychology, cognitive psychology, clinical psychology. But also we can see how it sort of extends into cultural studies in the sense of how every culture is, is a sort of a process of remembering and forgetting simultaneously. Right? So the, the second inference, second uh, point that I'm going to highlight a little bit in this lecture uh, is looking at forgetting and remembering as connected activities, as entangled activities. Right. So with these hypotheses, uh, with these inferences and with these arguments, let me dive into the session in terms of looking at the way in which we can look at the connection between uh, memory studies and medical humanities. Right. So what is medical humanities? So the, as the very title suggests, uh, it is uh, it's a very interdisciplinary kind of network of knowledge. Uh, and this is the beauty as well as the complexity of memory studies and medical humanities in the sense that it's very organically interdisciplinary. It doesn't have to be interdisciplinary. It doesn't have to look out uh, for interdisciplinary perspectives. It's very organically and ontologically uh, interdisciplinary in quality. So as I just mentioned, there is that embedded hardcore cognitive quality about remembering and forgetting. But equally, there is an extended cultural quality about remembering and forgetting. So we are immediately looking at uh, the interface of cultural studies, psychology, clinical psychology, cognitive psychology, uh, effects studies, uh, material engagement theory, uh, memory studies, and so on and so forth. So we can see there's a series of knowledge networks that we have at our disposal, which makes it such a complex field, which makes it a challenge as well as you know, part of its uh, rewarding quotient uh, is due to this complexity, this complex entanglement of different disciplines, shall we say. So uh, in terms of looking at what we can do with these two disciplines together, uh, uh, the two kinds of knowledge networks that we can have, the sort of convergences and sort of departures between memory studies and uh, medical humanities. So why do we situate humanities? Uh, and more specifically, why do we situate literature or literary studies uh, into these two disciplines? So my uh, effort uh, in this particular session is uh, So look at the research possibilities that might emerge uh, from this convergence. And this is something that we are doing uh, in IIT Madras. So we, we have this sort of research network of memory studies uh, that we uh, we had this annual conference last year as well. And we're hoping to sort of make this into a broader field uh, in uh, due course of time. So what are we really doing? Uh, who are we working with? Uh, what are the possibilities of this kind of research? Because one obvious thing that we can do with memory studies is to look at the relationship between the human brain and machines. And we have already worked with some uh, scientists and uh, people who work with augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, in terms of how a machine remembers uh, if there are any subliminal biases uh, in the way that information is fed into the machine and how the machine processes those information, etc. So there is that uh, obvious trajectory that memory studies can take. Uh, and obviously there's a very clinical component as well where we can potentially collaborate with doctors. And this is why medical humanities uh, has taken off uh, in, in a very major way, especially in British universities, Durham, uh, and also Leeds uh, and certain other places as well, where we have sort of medical humanities centers where we have people uh, from different disciplines, poets, uh, literary scholars, uh, writers, uh, as well as obviously doctors and philosophers and psychologists uh, who are sort of coming together and talking about memory loss, amnesia, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, etc., and looking at the way in which you know, different perspectives can really combine together uh, in terms of offering a more nuanced understanding of the human mind. And of course, as we all know, and we are listening to Professor Basu previously, uh, the mind is a very complex category. Uh, so, whereas the brain is sort of neural and medical and mappable by machines, etc., uh, there's almost this uh, you know, endlessly extended quality about the mind. 
so it is brain as well as something more than a brain. So there is a social discursive uh, quality about the mind as well, which, is, which makes it unmappable to a certain extent because there's this inside outside loop happening all the time. So whereas there is this very embedded neural quality, the way we process information, the way we accept information, the way we consume information, is obviously very neural in quality, and there are some very interesting books written on it. Uh, there's a very funny book that I recommend. It's called, Did My Neurons Make Me Do It? Uh, uh, it's supremely funny, it's dark humorous. It's looking at the relationship between free will, agency, and neurons. So it's making the argument that, is it possible to make the argument that everything is neural? So if I murder someone, is it really my fault? Or did my neurons make me do it? So it's obviously uh, in a very deliberately reductionist uh, in a very slapstick kind of a way. So that's just one kind of book that we can read. But we all know that it is not quite the case, that the mind is not neural, it's not just neural. There is obviously the cultural, discursive, phenomenological quality about the mind, which makes it simultaneously embedded and extended. And we are interested, uh, I personally find uh, Andy Clark's notion of cognition very, very interesting. And Andy Clark is a theorist that we use quite extensively, where he has a four E models of cognition that I'm sure is familiar to most of us here attending the session. And the four E models are the embedded, the embodied, the inactive, and the extended. So the, the, the four E models of cognition by Andy Clark. And he's looking at the mind as a constant process of all these different kinds of cognition, the embedded kind of cognition, it's new and quality, but equally the inactive, the extended, and the embodied, right? So all these different E's come together in terms of understanding of how the mind operates. Uh, and it obviously gives a very interesting uh, sort of unmappability about the mind, which makes it such a complex instrument uh, that we can look at from a cultural studies perspective, from a medical studies perspective, and obviously from a psychological, neuroscientific uh, perspective as well. Now, in terms of looking at literature, so why literature at all? Now that we have some kind of understanding between uh, memory studies and medical humanities, uh, what does literature come in? Uh, is it a bit of an outsider? Is it making a sort of trespass entry? Or is it a natural, very welcome guest uh, into this discourse network of mind, brain, medical humanities, memory studies, etc.? So let's look into that in a moment. Now, we need to define, we need to have certain ontological definitions of literature. And I find uh, some of the working definitions that I use, and this book that I'm writing now at the moment is very kindly mentioned in the introduction. A culture and the literary uh, matter, metaphor, memory. I'm looking at the relationship between matter and metaphor. Uh, so, how does matter become metaphor? What is a sort of complex process uh, through which matter is coded into something metaphorical, and then uh, the uh, how they get extended into memory? So, matter, metaphor, memory, which is the subtitle of the book that I'm writing. So, the whole relationship between the material and the metaphorical, and how that enters uh, the memory network, which is consumed uh, as a cultural activity, as a private activity, etc. But for us to sort of understand that, uh, let us look at, uh, let us sort of try at least uh, to have some working definitions of literature. So what is literature? And more importantly, what is fiction? So why look at fiction at all uh, in terms of understanding how uh, the medical condition of the mind, uh, how the memory condition of the mind works? Because we have neuroscience for that. We have psychology for that. We have uh, you know, different kinds of scientific medical uh, uh, instruments for that. So why look at fiction at all? So what is it about fiction that makes it a uh, sort of a unique uh, form of representation of the mind in terms of the, the medically determined mind as well as the remembering mind? So what is it about fiction and remembering? Now, my working definition of fiction, and obviously this is a very loose and generic definition that I've sort of devised for my own comfort, shall we say, uh, but my working definition of fiction is a production of possibilities. Right? So fiction is a production of possibility, possibilities. In other words, uh, it gives us uh, a very complex combination of what really happened or happens, uh, and it combines that with what could have happened or what can possibly happen. And it's a very constant combination of all these different perspectives, what really takes place uh, and what really took place, historically speaking, with what could have taken place and with what can take place. So there was this very interesting temporal quality about fiction, it's looking back as was looking forward. Because when I'm saying that it is a very complex combination of what really happened with what could have happened and what might happen, so what I'm actually saying is there's this very uh, sort of chronotope-like quality about fiction. Whereas looking back as well as uh, forward simultaneously. So there is this uh, 
shall we say, a temporal elasticity about fiction, which makes it such an accommodated media. And I'm looking at fiction, I'm interested in looking at fiction as a media, uh, just like we look at film as a media. I think it's important for us to sort of define fiction as a medium as well, uh, in terms of how that offers very nuanced understanding of the brain, the mind, the cultural mind, the medical mind, etc., the neural mind, etc. So why does fiction fit in? So if I were to go ahead with this definition of fiction as a production of possibilities, uh, possibilities which emerge from what really happens and uh, how that sort of is complicated by the possibilities which might have happened and also the possibilities which could have happened. So things which did not take place and all the things which did take place. So we combine all that together and complicate it further by saying, you know, things which may take place later. So uh, that's where the whole idea of science fiction comes in, things which are there as well as possibly there. Well, so there is this very permanent proleptic quality about fiction, uh, so sort of anticipatory quality about fiction. It's looking back, it's looking forward, and obviously that makes it such a fluid medium uh, of representation. And I'm interested in the sort of the ontology of fluidity, shall we say, right? Uh, the fluidity of fiction, and in terms of how that connects very interestingly with the fluidity of the remembering mind. Right? And I did talk a little bit about how the mind remembers and how remembering and uh, unremembering are uh, almost simultaneous activities, they're not ontological opposites of each other, but these are actually cognitive components of each other. Uh, and you know, we have some very interesting papers, and I'm happy to engage with that uh, in lengthier discussion later. Uh, if I'm happy to be engaged in that with the emails, uh, there are actually people writing very interesting uh, papers in, in neuroscience in the position of psychology, cognitive as well as clinical psychology, where they're talking about how forgetting as, as an ability is a very crucial cognitive ability for the mind, for the brain, uh, to keep functioning, right? Because forgetting must happen, and in some sense, we must be able to destroy information uh, in the brain. If you don't destroy information, it's like destroying cells. Uh, for an organism to evolve, it must be able to destroy cells, right? So destruction uh, is obviously an ability to a certain extent, and I was uh, speaking a couple of days before, uh, and, and I was drawing on Captain Malibu's uh, notion of plasticity. Uh, and it's a very fantastic concept because it's conceptually very complex, that notion of plasticity of Malibu. Because she's obviously talking about plasticity from a neural perspective, from a cellular perspective, uh, from a biological metabolic perspective, but also plasticity from a cultural perspective, uh, from a linguistic perspective, from a post-structuralist perspective. And the reason why I find Malibu or Captain Malibu and her work so fascinating for someone like me is because she offers a very critical theory understanding of the mind, a very post-structuralist understanding of the mind. I mean, Shonda, Sh I'm sure, uh, has read uh, Malibu and we have a discussions on Malibu and Derrida. It's like a very Derridan take uh, on how the mind functions, of how trauma happens. So in that sense, it's very post-Freudian. It's very post-classical, but it's more distributed, it's more fluid, it's more post-structuralist, uh, and, and that makes Malibu a very fascinating figure uh, for this kind of research. So, you know, the books that she's written, The Ontology of the Accident, for example, uh, Plasticity at Dusk. Uh, so these are books which talk about plasticity as a very uh, sort of conceptually rich phenomenon. And something which can be studied from different perspectives, uh, obviously cognitive, medical, uh, you know, uh, cellular, but also equally sort of cultural, linguistic, literary as well. So Malibu is one person that I'm very, very interested in. Now, just in terms of uh, looking at some other figures uh, in this kind of work, one neuroscientist, I mean, there are several neuroscientists that I have to uh, talk about, but someone who comes immediately in mind is a person called Joseph Ledoux. L-E-D-O-U-X. The Ledoux has a series of interesting books, and he, he is very, very famous as a neuroscientist for his work on the synapse, uh, or the synaptic quality of information. So synapse, as all of us know, uh, is the bit between the neurons. Uh, so when one neuron ends, another neuron begins, uh, that, that electrochemical transmission between neurons takes place in that area, the synapse. And now, interestingly, what Ledoux tells us today, uh, from a very hardcore neuroscientific perspective, is that we are our synapses. So information coding, information encoding, takes place apparently uh, in the synapses. And now that obviously raises our critical theory antenna in our brain, because isn't the synapse quite literally and quite territorially the in-between space? Isn't the synapse quite literally and quite territorially the liminal space, right? Where one information ends and the other information begins. So we begin to sniff uh, the structural similarities uh, from literary studies perspective. That, you know, isn't this some kind of a 
connection that one can potentially make. And Ledoux actually offers a very, very fascinating connections. I mean, he actually goes on to say, and I do recommend the book very, very heavily, The Synaptic Self, in terms of how that, you know, every information uh, must be lost in the process. That certain parts of every information must be destroyed in the process. So again, we're looking at plasticity uh, as a constant combination of uh, destruction and construction. Right? So any act of transmission must contain destruction uh, to a certain extent. And again, uh, we can go back to literature, to classic literature, and uh, there have actually been, you know, we all know about Proust and memory and all of that. There have been some very recent papers written on Proust and the hypothesis of Proust, the sort of smell memory hypothesis, as we all know. Uh, but another slightly less known uh, short story is a short story by Borges. Uh, and, you know, uh, the, the very famous story is Funus the Memorious, uh, or Funus the Memor Rememberer, as it gets translated uh, in different ways. So that story, again, is a sort of dark, humorous kind of story. It's slightly tough, Kaiskin quality, actually. So if you read that story, it's about a boy we call Funes uh, who falls from a, a horse and has, has a head injury. And the disease he has is that he loses the ability to forget. And that's obviously uh, very, very interesting. Because we, what Bob is telling us quite clearly is that forgetting is an ability. And the boy loses the ability. And that is a disease. That becomes a pathological condition. Now, what happens interestingly in the story is that his ability for abstractions begin to go away. His ability for empathy begins to go away. Uh, he, he, he cannot forget, he cannot destroy an information. So destruction as an ability, destruction as an agentic ability, that's something an individual must be able to do. You know, that is taken away from him through this injury, through his head injury. And there have been some very fascinating uh, works specifically on that uh, paper, with, uh, on that, that story, I'm sorry, where it, it talks about how this, the question of plasticity and destructive plasticity is a core cognitive component. And this is what the, uh, the very beginning of my talk I mentioned, that we need to look at forgetting not as an ontological opposite of remembering, but forgetting as a cognitive component of remembering, both at a micro level, in the sense of how the brain remembers, and also in terms of the macro level, in terms of how our culture remembers. Uh, you know, every act of remembering is also simultaneously an act of dismembering, as we all know, right? So Ledoux is one figure that I'm fascinated by, uh, and some more famous neuroscientists who are sort of looking at literature quite constantly, and also philosophy quite constantly, is obviously Antonio Damasio. I'm sure uh, Shona has read Damasio, we had discussions on Damasio with him, and I'm sure he's a very familiar figure uh, who's written on Spinoza, who's written on Dekra, who's written on, you know, he's looking at literature quite seriously in terms of how the effective fluid medium of fiction can actually offer a very nuanced understanding of the human mind which he thinks is a more complex category than the brain. And this, mind you, uh, is coming from a neuroscientist, a very globally acclaimed neuroscientist uh, who has phenomenal works uh, on sort of somato markers of cognition, phenomenal works uh, on the relationship between emotion and cognition. And again, this is why the master gets very, very interesting because he is a very, very strong uh, uh, sort of propounder, a very strong uh, sort of advocate of the relationship between emotion and cognition. Some of his best works in neuroscience is about that relationship. And that, in a way, undercuts uh, the very Cartesian claim of rationality and cognition, as we all know. Uh, the whole idea of the rational man being the, the cognitively potent man. So cognitive competence relies on rationality. If you go back to Dekra uh, and sort of dig him up uh, sort of, uh, and sort of look at the way in which cognition appears in the Cartesian understanding. A cognition as a product of rationality, uh, which is obviously trying to make itself ontologically different from emotionality. Now, when it comes to someone like Damasio, he says that actually emotions form a very core component of cognition. So if our ability to be emotional goes away, so in other words, if our affective ability goes away, that will also uh, sort of impact our effective ability. So again, we're looking at a very close relationship between affect and effect, right? So obviously literature as an affective medium, literature as a fluid medium, literature as a medium which can defamiliarize language becomes very important for someone like Damasio. And that obviously sort of really connects very well uh, in this discourse of memory studies and medical humanities. So Damasio is someone that we all know. Uh, he's written on Spinoza, he's written on Dekra, and he's written on a series of things that are interesting for us. Uh, the other neuroscientist that 
are interesting for us uh, is obviously Eric Kandel. Uh, you know, uh, Kandel has got books on, uh, he, he has written on Nabokov, uh, Joyce, uh, Wolf, in terms of, again, the idea of the epiphany, the idea of the sort of cognitive understanding of the epiphany and how the affective description of epiphany, the affective extended quality of epiphany is something which is very, very complex from a cognitive perspective. So what happens when a mind experiences epiphany? And you know, those of us interested in modernist literature will know uh, epiphany is a very serious business of literature. Uh, you know, modernism is a lot of epiphanies about the thinking mind suddenly having a revelation and how the revelation is especially when it comes to someone like Joyce, we find out how he complicates the biblical quality of the epiphany and makes it so secular, almost sexual and erotic in quality. So we have this very interesting erotic epiphany in Joyce, which is obviously quite discurs uh, discursive because we have this very repressed Catholic subjects and a very repressed Dublin, claustrophobic Dublin, uh, experiencing the sexual phenomenon of epiphany. So again, what happens when the epiphany takes place? So how do we describe it? And we have someone like Candle, Eric Candle, who's actually looking at Nabokov and Joyce and Wolf, and of course Krauss, of Krauss is a poster boy for memory studies, as we all know, uh, in terms of a more complex understanding of cognition. Right? So, uh, and I'm just going to begin to wind up now, but uh, I'm just going to connect someone like Ledoux uh, to another theory that I find quite interesting. And that theory is a theory of cognitive narratology. Right? Uh, and one of the biggest figures uh, in that theory is David Herman. Uh, someone I was very lucky to know personally in Durham. Uh, so Herman's work on storytelling uh, and a cognitive sciences is something which is fascinating because he looks at the activity of storytelling, uh, again, as a neural activity, how we process information and how we reprocess and represent information in a narrative. So that is the micro private quality of storytelling, but also storytelling as a cultural activity. So how do we preserve information through storytelling? So the whole business of oral narratives, for example, the whole storytelling quality, uh, how it becomes some kind of an archive, uh, a collectively shared archive, shall we say, uh, of incidents, events, things which happen, and again, equally things which did not happen, things which could have happened, but were not allowed to happen. So storytelling, obviously, as we all know, can be a very profoundly politically subversive activity. Uh, so storytellers can be subversive, and we have endless examples in fiction, but also cinema and philosophy, uh, in a study from Plato who banishes the poet uh, from the Republic. So storytelling can become, uh, because then again, if you go back to the earlier definition of fiction that I have, fiction as a combination of what really is taking place with what could take place, and sometimes what with what should take place. So there, that there is this utopian quality about fiction as well. It can also tell us about what really should be happening, and obviously that tells us what is not really happening. So again, we have the production of absence in fiction. So it can tell us things which are happening and also things which are not happening. So not happening becomes a very important business in fiction, just like unremembering uh, to a certain extent. And again, we are looking at unremembering uh, very seriously as a political activity, as a discursive activity, and obviously as a cognitive activity in some sense. It does wind up with Herman and how that connects to someone like Joseph Ledoux. Uh, Herman in this uh, phenomenal book, which I recommend uh, very, very heavily, a Storytelling and the Sciences of the Mind, he has a very interesting idea of chunking. Uh, so what is chunking, essentially? And chunking is something which neuroscientists are very, very uh, increasingly interested in. So in other words, chunking is a certain bit of information which gets processed. So again, we go back to Ledoux, uh, who is saying that every act of transmission, neural act of transmission, is also a loss of transmission. In other words, what Herman is saying and what Ledoux is also saying, and interestingly, Ledoux also uses the word chunking. I'm sure they don't know each other. Please didn't know each other when they're writing the two separate books. <laughs> but you know, it's an interesting thing that even a neuroscientist and a storytelling, uh, someone who's working on cognitive nabdology are talking about the same concept using the same word, the idea of chunking. In other words, what the brain remembers is always in chunks. In the moment I use the word chunk, I'm talking about the politics of inclusion. Certain things are included in a, certain, in, a, in, a, in a particular chunk, but also equally the politics of exclusion. So again, the certain things are excluded from a certain chunk, right? So a chunk can become a metaphor of this entanglement of absence and presence, the entanglement of inclusion and exclusion. And, uh, and Herman uh, in that book, uh, Storytelling and the Sciences of the Mind, he's talking about how 
the whole idea of narratology, how we tell stories, is a decision of chunking. So what gets chunked and what gets de-chunked? And again, we are back to the same fundamental principle that de-chunking is not an innocent activity. De-chunking is a very politically motivated activity. And even at a very neural embedded level, de-chunking is a very biased activity. Every brain is biased. The brain is a very bloody biased machine. And again, culture is equally biased, right? So the whole, the whole politics of bias, the whole uh, ontology of bias becomes very, very complex. If you look at these two convergence of medical humanities, memory studies, literature, culture, philosophy, psychology, etc. So I'm just going to wind up here with the idea of chunking. And I'm just going to go back uh, and finish with Derrida because I know Shomrad is a fanboy and I owe it to him. And I'm sort of a fanboy as well on Derrida. So let's end with Derrida. Uh, and Derrida has written extensively on the idea of absence in literature. And his very famous book, Acts of Literature, for example. But equally, uh, and this is why he's beginning to become big in memory studies, he also writes about traces. And Shomrad knows much more about this than I do. I'm sure he can discuss it later in the Q&A session. The quality, the, the idea of the trace in Derrida, something which gets erased, but not quite, right? It's sort of there, some kind of a ontological presence. And obviously, ontology is a profoundly political category. Spectrality is a profoundly political category. And, you know, some of that has spoken on spectrality in a fascinating session. But, you know, again, we're looking at absence as a political presence, absence as a political production, absence as a biased production, and also remembering, unremembering absence, they all become very, very biased and entangled together. And that is why, uh, that is where I think fiction can emerge as a very potent and fluid medium of representation and understanding. And that is why people like us, you know, at the end of the day, we are literary persons, we are literary theorists, we are critical theorists, people like us, we must, uh, so there's a danger, I should also warn a little bit, there's a danger of seduction as well. Uh, we can be a bit too seduced by neuroscience and philosophy and psychology uh, and move a little bit too much towards the empirical mode. Uh, but we need to ground ourselves very interestingly and very sort of robustly in literature, I think, because I think uh, the attention is coming from outside as well. Uh, neuroscientists are looking at literature. People like Damasio and Ladue and Kendall are actually talking about literature and literary discourses and literary representations. So I think we need to focus on fiction uh, as a medium, fiction as an ambivalent medium, and I use the word ambivalence quite uh, sort of etymologically as well as uh, ontologically. Ambivalence not as confusion, but ambivalence is ambivalent. So, Plural possibilities, ambivalence as ability to accommodate and articulate differences, ambivalence as ability to articulate two valences which are mutually contradictory with each other. So literature has the ability to articulate remembering as well as unremembering. So all you have to do is read someone like Kundera, for example, uh, you know, the book of laughter and forgetting, where forgetting becomes such an important activity uh, for the individual as well as for a particular culture in a post communist Slovakia, for example, where the spectrality of communism is so much there in a pretty derided sense, but doesn't get talked about. And paradoxically, this not being talked about actually makes it representational in a certain sense. So I'm just going to end here at this point, and I'm happy to take questions uh, here at this particular session, but also I'm happy to engage in lengthier discussions over emails. So feel free to write to me subsequently as well. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Abhishek. Uh, it was a very, very energetic, very, very energetic session. And I'm happy uh, that it perfectly complements Professor Basu's lead, uh, which he gave before you. Uh, it, was, it, it was perfectly complementing because I asked a question of the literary, which Basu definitely answered in his own way. But uh, your uh, deliberation basically prolonged that uh, idea of the literary. Uh, so uh, the certain queries, certain elaborations which were required uh, also uh, comes in your talk. So I will begin with my own question. Uh, let the questions come. In the mean, meanwhile, some questions are coming. So let them come. But uh, then I can ask you some, some questions. Uh, and some certain conversations we can have among ourselves. So one is, again, going back to Derrida. I noted down this question before you referred Derrida. So uh, it's a question. Derrida has uh, a very interesting essay called How to Speak 
uh, how to avoid speaking about denials mm. how to avoid speaking about denials is a very very interesting question uh, so it connects uh, the notion of speech the notion of denial uh, and uh, this is definitely a very very uh, political question and uh, my point is how to connect uh, this political questions and its ideological dimension with neuroscience uh, that is uh, one question you can you can take two or three and then you can uh, engage, uh, answer and then another thing related to this i was just wondering as i was listening to your talk because i have been reading about entanglement and neuroscience for some time and i i always wondered about what kind of dialogue or connection we can have possibly with delusious notion of assemblage which is a very very political term like entanglement in brain which is apparently a non political biologically rooted neural activity which can uh, be biased quote and quote biased you mentioned the term bias the very important term i think in the negative sense but also how we can repoliticize it and think of the neuro neurological activity as a possibility for assemblage i know that two terms are very very different and they are they are also spoken in different context assemblage is a political term where the you know the minority uh, thinking comes together the women the nomad the children they excluded they form a loose assemblage unlike the bigger networks of uh, nation state so uh, how you relate this notion of the assemblage with the notion of entanglement you can take those these two perhaps and then we can proceed with that yes. excellent question another excellent question obviously you are the reader scholar uh, uh, i haven't specifically read that particular essay that you mentioned but i'm aware of the work I'm aware of the sentiment that the reader is trying to talk about in that particular essay. So we know in cultures that is really every act of communication is political. So you know, uh, and uh, the brain, the moment the brain happens as a neural phenomenon, as an electrochemical phenomenon, the brain is uh, sometimes a situated brain. And one particular theorist I find interesting, I have mentioned him as well as Andy Clark. And Andy Clark's notion of a situated brain. Uh, is interesting because i think that's exactly what he is saying what we are talking about over here yeah? the brain as an electrochemical phenomenon uh, the brain as a cognitive phenomenon but the brain as a something is a situated phenomenon so the, the inside outside loop uh, begins to get really interestingly entangled together as uh, a brain as something uh, which is cognizing reality and consuming reality through an embedded process which is neural it's inside the brain but also an equally through an extended process an inactive process so the four e's of cognition by clark is interesting extended embodied inactive uh, and uh, sort of uh, inactive extended embodied uh, and uh, embedded yes anyway so the four e's of cognition uh, are very very important and how we uh, encode information because uh, you know if you look at the brain and it's a very pertinent question and this is what i meant at the end Uh, of my session that we should not be too seduced by neuroscience and looking at uh, from this particular perspective because that is perfectly possible that we have this fancy labs and the lovely neuroscientists working in uh, magnificent coats and the scientific experiments blah 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 but at the end of the day we need to be honest about our location uh, as a discipline uh, in this particular epistem we need to be honest uh, and candid about and proud also about our location as literary people Uh, as critical theorists uh, because i think uh, the time has come when the dialogue has become more symmetrical right it's not really all symmetrical anymore because even they are looking at literature even they are looking at literary studies uh, in terms of a more nuanced understanding of the mind and why is the mind suddenly so hot in neuroscience right uh, there are scientists writing on the mind i mean Demasio has got a book called the self comes to mind i mean can you believe it it's, it's a hot for neuroscientists who might win a nobel prize someday and is writing a book which is called the self comes to mind i mean the self the mind what are we talking about with the very philosophical terms right so i think the dialogue with the neuroscience and literature and philosophy is becoming more symmetric and that's a very optimistic thing i'm very optimistic about the symmetry of those dialogues so we don't really have to sort of be desperate in terms of clinging on to neuroscience and i i can personally say 
that I had a desperation at the beginning of my PhD and my supervisor shot it down very quickly, very brutally, much to my advantage <laughs> later. So she very clearly told me that, you know, it's awfully possible to be seduced and read, you know, you know, lab experiments and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, we need to be aware of our epistemic location as a literary scholar and as cultural theorists. So just to answer your question, I think the idea of a situated brain is becoming big uh, in neuroscience today. And that sort of connects very interestingly uh, in, in a very complex way. Again, and this is where Deleuze comes in as well, the whole idea of assemblage. And Deleuze is a very fine figure for this because it talks about sort of capitalism, schizophrenia, data formation, rhizome. Because, you know, that metaphor, the rhizome, it, it can, you know, I was talking about the mad metaphor the other day in a session. A metaphor that can consume endless metaphors, right? So there is this rhizomatic quality for the rhizome as a metaphor, right? It can become, it can mean anything. Uh, it can also unmean anything, right? It can spread like capitalism, uh, and at the same time, it can keep revising itself. So I was talking about the virus, uh, the COVID-19 virus, uh, some kind of a rhizome that keeps mutating itself in, in a way that it becomes a mad metaphor of so many other things. So I think Deleuze is a very crucial figure uh, in terms of an understanding of sort of the brain, uh, the sick brain, uh, and also the cultural matrices that produce sickness and consume sickness. In the same way as Malibu is, and I'm sure you've read Malibu's works uh, on plasticity and the ontology of the uh, accident. You know, the whole idea of the accident uh, as an interruption, which is obviously cognitive, it happens through trauma, through injury, etc. But also, it is quite experiential, and in that sense, it's quite extended. So our consumption of discursive reality is interrupted in some sense. Our consumption of language is interrupted in some sense. I mean, we can think of something as basic, I mean, forgive me for using the word basic, but something as classic as Mrs. Jalloway is a very fine example. So we have a PTSD veteran coming back from the war. Uh, he had gone to the war with a certain kind of masculinity, and he comes back from the war as an exhausted man, and he cannot connect to reality, right? So his problem, the problem of Septimus Smith in Mrs. Jalloway, is also is obviously neural, it is inside, but also he fails to connect to anything around him. And that is a very discursive thing. So I think you're completely right in, in terms of looking at uh, Deleuze in terms of looking at Derrida, but my only caveat, and this is something I've shared with you personally before, is that people like us uh, in this field, and, and I do hold myself accountable as well, we should not be too seduced uh, by the, uh, the, the, the carrots of neuroscience uh, to a certain extent, uh, which are dangling before us. We must uh, robustly locate ourselves as critical theorists, and we must come to neuroscience through critical theory, and uh, not the other way around, I think. Uh, thank you, Obishek. I think this point that you made about the symmetry and the ability of the critical theory, philosophy, and humanities to talk back and relate to the hard, quote unquote, hard sciences actually yes. collapses the, the uh, kind of scientism which we encourage in, uh, often encourage in uh, our system of knowledge. And that is Basically, I should pronounce it clearly, that is basically my purpose to uh, organize this talk. And I think that uh, I've been successful. So getting into some further questions, uh, questions are coming, but then uh, I take the privilege of being host, the host and ask another one or two questions, which I think uh, is pertinent and we can know more about this from you. Uh, one is uh, the way now, you talked about the unmappability of mind, which is a very, very important point. And uh, uh, while there is the unmappability of the mind, the market, the economy, hmm, uh, it tries to you know, map the mind in a certain sense. I was reading exactly. uh, the book exactly. by Bang, Bang Chul Han, uh, uh, the Chinese scholar, who talked about who, the name of his book is Psychopolitics. There is a subtitle, I don't remember. But psychopolitics as a notion, which overcomes the notion of the biopolitics, psychopolitics yeah. as a mechanism to control yeah. and map our mind. So how do you think of this kind of determinability in terms of uh, the neuro neurological thinking? And connected yeah. to this, uh, do you think that fiction, fiction actually has the ability to question this apparent unimmediatedness and a fiction you talked about the media which is 
the medium, media, the word you use is very, very important and pertinent here because media is something which, uh, which we become more conscious while reading fiction. You know, when we think about the hard sciences, it is more transparent. But when we read fiction, we always remember the unrememberability or the dismembering quality of our thinking. So the yeah. mediatedness yeah. is, and that is very pertinent in, even in the age of the digital media, given the interest of, in digital humanities that attracts both of us and mm. the virtual world in which we live. So that is the last question. After that, I will ask what, whatever has come from the audience. Very good. Exactly what I meant. Uh, the, the risk of reification, as I mentioned, the risk of uh, very reductionist thinking. Uh, and as you correctly pointed out, the whole idea of psychopolitics. And I can uh, mention something which sounds even more uh, strange. There's actually a domain of knowledge called neuroeconomics, right? Uh, and neuroeconomics uh, is sort of looking at decision making as a neural phenomenon and how that connects to broader institutions such as share market, uh, such as you know, investing in stocks and how the, the neural behavior uh, of the consumer uh, becomes sort of a macro phenomenon in some sense. So again, uh, the attempt, as you very correctly pointed out, the attempt is to map human behavior. That is to sort of make in some sort of formulaic activity. That, you know, if you're neurally this way, then you'll behave that way. Uh, so you'll, you buy these stocks, uh, you'll buy these shares, you'll buy X shares if you're neurally in a Y position. So it's very mathematical in a certain sense. And obviously that is a problem. And that is exactly the un why the unmappability of fiction uh, as a medium becomes interesting. Because as you, as you correctly pointed out, I mean, there's a lot of work done on fiction. But I think we need to also pay some attention on fiction as a medium. We, we keep talking about cinema as a medium. We keep talking about a uh, digital space as a medium. But you know, there has been very few works, and I can't think of anything at the moment, top of my head, perhaps as you can or other people can, uh, on a very serious work on looking at fiction as a medium. And what is it that attracts us uh, as a medium of fiction? And as I correctly pointed out, one advantage uh, or one complexity perhaps that the fiction has is that it is very metacognitive in quality, right? So when you're consuming fiction, you're aware of the consumption process as well. And fiction offers you that metacognitive quality to a certain extent. So when you open Jedi, when you open David Copperfield, when you begin to read it, you're aware of the immersive process, right? Because you're aware of you consuming. So there is an added dimension about you looking at yourself reading that book, right? Or reading that fiction. So that metacognitive quality is, I think, what makes fiction such a fluid and complex uh, phenomenon, that complex activity uh, in a certain sense. So I think we need to pay more attention uh, to the, the ontology of fiction as a medium, the experience of fiction as a medium, fiction as, fiction as an affective medium, uh, what, what does it do to us in terms of affective understanding of reality. And also, I mean, if you think in a very basic way, and this is a question that I sometimes ask and to students, so why is it that fiction books get banned, right? So you know, why take uh, Satan versus seriously? Why take Ulysses seriously? So what is the seriousness that we need to give to fiction? So you know, institutions which ban fiction, they're actually quite aware of the metacognitive quality of fiction. Uh, that sometimes that maybe that we haven't doubt uh, sufficiently, right? So the whole politics of banning fiction is because we are looking at, while reading a book of fiction, we are aware of our consuming a certain kind of knowledge. So we're looking at ourselves also consuming that knowledge. And that can be subversive. Right? There's an immediate subversive quality in fiction, which I argue comes to the metacognitive quality. So again, this goes back to your first question, the cognitive and the subversive, the embedded and the extended are connected categories. Right? So, uh, and because you never think about it in a very rational institutional sense, what is a big deal about Ulysses? What is a big deal about Lady Chapter's lover? I mean, it's not claiming to be real. It's not claiming to be a documentary of anything. Uh, it's not claiming to be a reflection of anything. It's fiction. So what is it about the medium which makes it so subversive? And my argument is, at least from where I stand today, in, in my very modest scholarship on the subject, my argument is the subversive lies in a metacognitive, right? And that is, a, that is an area we need to tap into, the metacognitive quality of fiction. We are sort of aware of our understanding of reality through fiction. We are looking at ourselves as people reading a book. And that metacognitive quality, the cognition of cognition, is what makes fiction perhaps a very immediately subversive medium.
So that would be my response to your question. <clears throat> Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, I, I, you just remembered me. Uh, the I was reading Derrida's The Eye of the University, where he was talking about to see the sea. Yeah, to see exactly. the sea. So again, yeah. there are overlaps yeah, with Derrida. Right. It continu yeah. continuously yeah. overlaps and uh, you know relates and entangles with uh, the other fields and other disciplines. Uh, so yeah, uh, being a Derrida fan again. As we have already claimed it to be so. Yeah, yes. huh. I'm saying so I'm, it's like Hamlet's yeah. father, uh, right? He never goes away. He's always there. Yeah. Goes away. He's there. Yeah. Uh, so I will just ask a few questions from uh, what has what what has come from the audience. Uh, one is uh, Pavel. Please highlight the questions. The last but one question uh, by Sakshi Srivastav. Please. Okay. Uh, Pavel, can you highlight on the screen by Sakshi Sivasta? Uh, yeah. What do you think of the temporal disruptions of memory due to illness, illnesses like dementia, as often appropriated in the temporal flexibility in fiction for the sake of poetic justice of some kind? Yes. It's a very that good is, question. Yeah. It's a very fine question. Uh, so, this is exactly why fiction is such an ambivalent medium. Uh, I think we need to be, this is a very good question, because I think what Sakshi is, if I understand it correctly, uh, where is the moral quality for fiction? If you're looking at something like dementia, which is obviously a very serious illness, and if you're sort of stylizing it, just because you happen to have a particular fictional medium, you can play around with it, or you have stream of consciousness, you have vocalization, etc. So, you know, fiction will offer you the flexibility to stylize dementia. So, is it really... Is, is, this, is it a moral activity, I think? Uh, and that's a very serious question, I think. The temporal disruption of memory due to illness as often appropriated. And I'm very interested in the word appropriation in fiction. And this is exactly uh, the point of the media. We, we need to look at fiction as a very open-ended media. Again, so if there's one risk of reification from one end, like we are also doing in neuroscience, etc., there's the other risk of reification as well. So we are, we are sort of seduced by abstractions. We are seduced by uh, the innate morality of fiction. Fiction is amoral, I think. That is my very basic argument. Uh, fiction doesn't, doesn't have morality. Fiction shouldn't have morality, I think. So the amorality of fiction is something which we need to foreground and flag up very, very clearly. And that's exactly what Sakshi is uh, asking, I think. So when you're appropriate, and obviously appropriation is an act of consumption, you're taking that, you're making that a commodity. So we have a very serious illness like dementia. And how do we appropriate that by stylizing it in fiction? Just because it's a fluid medium, it gives you the flexibility to stylize it uh, to a certain extent. So how moral is that? Is that, a, is, a, is that a right act? Is that a correct act? So my response to that would be, this is exactly why we look, need to look at fiction as an ambivalent activity, right? It is our moral. It is profoundly amoral, it is profoundly complex, and it can just offer you possibilities, I think. And this is, again, my basic principle definition of fiction, as a production of possibilities, right? Which can be amoral, moral, profoundly uh, moral, profoundly amoral, and perhaps all together, right? So my response to that would be, again, to go back to the earlier thing that we are discussing, we need to be aware uh, of the other risk of reification in fiction. Right? Fiction as a moral mapping. We should not allow ourselves to sort of go in that direction as well. But the temporal disjunctions of memory, uh, and this, this is where, you know, in, to a certain extent, uh, Malibu talks about that as well, uh, in terms of how uh, the fracture of an event, uh, the disjunction, the, the sort of post temporal quality uh, is something that, you know, fiction can offer uh, in terms of, and it, she, she talks about uh, Kafka's metamorphosis uh, as a very fine example of that. Right, uh, how there's a sort of temporal disjunction, uh, a temporality, a temporal order comes to an end, and we have a new temporal order coming, and how there's a fictional template that is there in Kafka's metamorphosis. And Kafka is amoral, I think. Kafka is profoundly amoral. Kafka's fiction has no morality. Right, so we need to be aware uh, of the amorality of fiction. I think that's also part of the, the complexity of the medium, the amorality of fiction. So that would be my response to a really good question by Sachi. Thank you for that. Again, thanks. Uh, and uh, Obishek, can you please pronounce your email ID? There are some questions on, you know, uh, the, the the suggestions for reading and etc. Then we can you can respond them later 
uh, over the mail because we are, we are not going to read them. Uh, can you please pronounce your uh, email ID once? Then we can ask the other question. Abhishek, your mic, just switch on the mic. Just no, tell your mic. email ID. No, yeah. yeah. I just said I, I typed my email in the chat box. But my email ID is very simple. It is my name, Abhishek Parvi, uh, at iitn.iac.in. Or you can also email me at abhishekparvi at gmail.com. Just my name, all small letters, at gmail.com. Or my work email, which is iitn. Ask, ask one or two questions. Uh, so, Shambhra, can, 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 can I make a request? Yeah. Can I make a request? One final question. question. I'm in my office. And yeah, yeah, drive, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure. I'll just ask one final question and then uh, wrap up. Uh, so, uh, this is a question by Simoni Chattava, the diasporic characters. Uh, just as the diasporic characters are forced to consciously forget their past in order to survive and continue with their present and eventually their future. So it's an, I think yes. it's a cryptic yes. question. Yes. I can see it. If you can see that, if you can see that, if you can see that, in the context of diaspora narratives, can memory be symbolized with the figure of a two-faced genus as the diaspora characters are forced to consciously forget their past in order to survive and continue with the present and eventually their future. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. So this is a, a very classic example of the uh, the memory of the future, right? Uh, the future that can happen. So, you know, the whole idea of the diasporic identity is a very complex combination of nostalgia and aspiration, as we all know. There's a very strong aspirational quality about any diasporic identity. So there's a very nostalgic quality about the identity, and equally there's an aspirational quality. So there's, there's a forward-looking uh, uh, quality about memory as well. And in that quality of forward-lookingness, I mean, it's a terrible one, please ignore it. But in that quality of forward-lookingness, uh, we have the idea of conscious oblivion, a deliberate oblivion. And again, if you look at Kundera, I mean, I find Kundera is a very fertile uh, field for this kind of work. So we have grandmothers who don't want to talk about communism. We have, uh, you, know, you know, older generations of people who just refuse to talk about that at all. And they're very consciously trying to forget uh, in that sense. No one talks about certain things. It is sort of unofficially banned. And the whole idea of not talking about that, not discussing that, uh, is obviously an idea, a strategy to sort of obliterate it. Now, just to come back to a hardcore psychological perspective on this, there's one uh, theorist, uh, one psychologist that I think is a bit understudied, but I think we need to go back to that figure and dig him up a little bit, uh, is a figure called Pierre Janet, J-A-N-E-T. Now, Janet was a, was a person who coined the term traumatic memory. It wasn't Freud. So he was a contemporary of Freud, but obviously he got overshadowed by the more famous Freud. Uh, but I've got nothing against Freud, but I think Janet is someone who needs to we need to look at as well. Now, interestingly, Jeanette defines two kinds of memories in this particular context that you know, Schumann talked about as Marx. So Jeanette talks about traumatic memory and interestingly, narrative memory, right? And he talks about the transition of traumatic memory into narrative memory. And sometimes how traumatic memory may not become narrative memory. And this is obviously a brain decision. This is obviously a bias decision that I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to convert into a narrative, but also it can be a collective decision. As I think that this is what the question is going to look at. The, the trauma of mobility, the trauma of migration, uh, the experience of dislocation, can we get rid of it by not talking about it, right? So can we refuse uh, the, the transition into narrative memory? So again, if you go back to something like uh, as popular as, let's say, Mouse by Art Spiegelman, which is about the Holocaust narrative and writing a graphic novel about the Holocaust, right? So that itself, the medium is very important over here. We were writing a comic book on the Holocaust, right? And in, in that, there's one particular scene where, you know, Artie Spiegelman, who is the writer in the novel, he goes to his father, Vladek, and he's trying to interview him. And the father does not want to talk about it. And this refusal of the traumatic memory into becoming narrative memory, because mind you, uh, narrative memory is a commodity. 
isn't it? The moment you make that into a directive, you can make that into a commodity which can be sold, which can be consumed endlessly. So that refusal is also an agentic refusal to a certain extent. I don't want my trauma to become a narrative to a certain extent. I, I refuse the shape of the narrative. And I think we need to go back to someone like Jeanette, Pia Jeanette, who makes a very clear distinction. And this is something which is original so because Freud never talks about that at all. There's no way in Freud, at least in my reading of Freud, he never talks about these two kinds of memory at all. But Jeanette is very clearly telling that for traumatic memory to become narrative memory, it must be a conscious process of recollection, a conscious process. And we can connect it back to the idea of chunking. We need to chunk in certain information and chunk out certain information. And that becomes a very deliberate choice, a very micro choice, a very agentic choice, and equally a communal choice to a certain extent, a cultural choice, a demographic choice to a certain extent. I think if you read Kundera, the book, the book of laughter and forgetting, so how forgetting becomes an act of production in Kundera is not an absence at all. Uh, forgetting is produced uh, through certain rituals. Uh, you know, grandmothers don't talk about these things. So again, not talking obviously makes it into some kind of productive activity, the production of forgetting. So I think it's a very, very good question. That is something which interests me personally as well. Obhishek, a big clap for you. Thank you. It was an excellent presentation. You were on fire. Literally, you were on fire today. I heard uh, one or two of your presentations before in recent times. So thank you very much uh, for this excellent presentation that you made. Uh, I just want uh, to wrap up by thanking, uh, giving a, a short thank giving of just one minute, then we can break. Uh, I thank Shambhilani Mahabiddalai for allowing us to organize this event, uh, the Department of English. Uh, our principal, uh, Dr. Shantiranjan Pal Choudhury, without whose inspiration this event would not have been a possibility. Uh, the coordinator of IQSE, uh, Professor Ruma Chakravarti, Department of Bengali. Uh, she was present there in the first session uh, because we are collaborating, we have collaborated with the IQSE, Internet, uh, Internal Quality Assurance Cell. Uh, I thank my departmental colleagues, the senior most faculty member, Professor Mamata Sharkar, uh, uh, Professor Parthopratim Roy Choudhury, who is still there with us. Pavel, can, you, can we see you? Please, can you please switch on your uh, video? <laughs> we want to see your face, uh, my dear colleagues. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, uh, we are back. Uh, Meg yes, Boron. Back. Yeah. Uh, Meg Boron is not here with us now. He has just presented uh, Obishek. Maybe he's busy. But I thank Meg Boron Haiti. And of course, the man behind the show, uh, Avel Money, without whose assistance, nothing would have been possible. A big hand for Avel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you are the main person behind the show. And last but not the least, of course, the most important people who made this event successful, our speakers, Professor Devashish Banerjee and Professor Onirban Dash uh, from first day, Professor Onushtu Bashu, and here with us, Professor Ovishek Parui, today, the second day. And uh, a small announcement is that we are going to continue this lecture series. This is not a seminar, not a webinar. This is a kind of orientation uh, in critical theory, philosophy, and crossing the boundaries of humanity for a larger audience uh, so that the new system of knowledge, new ways of doing humanities can excite you. Thank you very much. Big hand uh, to all of I you. Think, uh, I think I would also like to say that uh, yeah. a big thank is due to Dr. Shomrat Shengupta for organizing this. He's the life force behind everything course, course. Over, here. over here. So thank, thank you, you. Shomrat. Thank you, Shomrat. Life force. So we can break. Thank you. Thank you. We can break. Yeah. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.